Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, we'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. God wants us to be a flame that can't be put out through the power of the Holy Spirit, that others would be drawn to its warmth, drawn to the fire of the Holy Spirit for hope and for peace and for salvation. God has called us to be more and do more through the power of the Holy Spirit. God has called us to be His church on fire. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, online campus. Can we say good morning, online campus here together this morning? All right, good morning, North Campus. Good to be with all of you as well. Can we welcome the North Campus here this morning? All right. Well, we're so thankful for each one of you. Before we jump into the message, I want to just talk about uh, an announcement that we made a couple of weeks ago uh, regarding myself. And so I wanted to cover that uh, personally first. So we let a, a video out a few couple of weeks ago about a short sabbatical that I'm going to be taking. And it's in July. It hasn't started yet. Everybody say July with me. Okay. So this month is... May, you had to think about it though, didn't you? Yeah, so it's not till July, all right? So a couple of thoughts on that though, and so we wanted to address that. I had some vacation planned already for the last week of June and then uh, another one end of June. We take most of our vacations in the summer because that's our favorite time of the year. It's warm and all that kind of stuff. But in between, there's about two and a half weeks. And with the couple of seasons we've come through, it's been kind of a long four years. It's been an amazing four years, uh, but I think we'd all agree it wasn't without challenges and leading and all those kind of things. It's been, uh, it's been hard. And so it's important uh, as uh, a leader here at Christ Community Church that I take some time to refresh, to really have some deep times of prayer, uh, to really spend some deep times in the Word and communing with God. And so those two and a half weeks in the middle, plus those two vacation weeks, are going to make up a time of refreshment and rest. There'll be some time with family and then some time of solitude, which I don't know how well I'm going to do with that because you know that I'm a people person. So we'll see. God will God'll be with me. But a um, couple of things you need to know about that. The whole goal of that uh, is for myself uh, to be refreshed and then from that refreshing, uh, be able to lead us here as a church. And that's the idea behind that. If you could pray in that, there's a couple things you could do is to pray, first off, uh, that I'll be able to shut my mind off. If you think of a brain as, uh, as a computer screen, I always have 10 to 12 tabs open at the same time, okay? Maybe more than that. Uh, but I'm just prayerful that God would give me a time to be able to really slow my mind down and really listen and sit with him uh, in silence. And so it sounds like a simple prayer. Uh, it is. Uh, but I know it's going to have a profound in, uh, impact, so I'd ask you to do that. I'd also ask you to continue to come on the weekend and, and, and be a part of services in person or online. Uh, enjoy your midweek ministry. Please continue to give the way you have been, faithfully and cheerfully and sacrificially. Uh, the ministry moves forward, and, and so we wouldn't have a ministry if it wasn't uh, without all of you. And so that part's important. Let's continue doing what we're doing and God will continue to do what he's doing in this area. And he's doing some amazing things. Would you guys agree? You didn't convince me. Would you guys agree that he's doing some amazing things? The other part of this is, is that we're in a time that I'm very grateful that we have a staff team and a church volunteer and volunteer leadership team that allows me to actually go away and take this time. And I don't ever want to take that for granted. I don't want to take any of you for granted or our staff for granted. We have a, a preaching team that a lot of churches just don't have the luxury of having, and we have a great preaching team. I mean, they've been doing a great job, Tom and Conrad and Bailey. And so we're able 
I'm able to take some time off with confidence. I'm not really concerned at all with the ministry moving forward here uh, with all of them and then an excellent elder team to oversee all of that. We're really just blessed by that. So that's sabbatical. Everybody say July with me. If you know some folks who aren't here that thought it already started, please tell them the truth. You can give them all those details, okay? And so uh, the last thing I think it's important to say for those who have been around a little while, I am not looking for a job while I'm on sabbatical. I love it here. I don't, if I was going to work someplace else, it wouldn't be another church, okay? I want to work here. I love this church. I love this community. I love, this is the church I'm called to. I'm not going anywhere, and the elders are not looking for another pastor either. So we're good. It's just a time to be equipped for the next season. But um, you know us. We like to state the obvious, and I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, I'm not looking for a job, and they're not looking for a new lead pastor. You guys all clear on that one online, hopefully in North as well? Yeah, praise God. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into our message here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time. Uh, First off, God, we thank you that you give us times of rest. And uh, Lord, may we never take those times of rest for granted. Lord, um, I'm grateful that that we're able to uh, have a space where where I can get uh, a little time away to to dive deeper into my relationship with you, to, to be filled up. So God, that we could... Uh, just continue, uh, Lord, to, to move forward as a, as a ministry, as you equip me and as I equip others, all through the power of the Holy Spirit and all in the name and the authority of Christ Jesus, God, as you are our chief shepherd. We just thank you for that. I thank you for this amazing church and just a, such a great body of people who are ready, willing, and able to do uh, what you're calling them to do uh, when, when they're called to do it. And I just i am so thankful for that, God. Thankful, God, for our staff team, uh, all of our our pastors and and directors and staff members, all of our uh, ministry leaders and volunteer staff members and our elders, God. Uh, We're just blessed. And God, may we not take for granted the time, the chapter of Christ Community Church that we're in, and also the work that you're doing in people's lives, in our own community, in our own congregation, and outward in our city and in the surrounding towns, God. You're doing a work Uh, and a work that we're probably not even aware of at some level, God. So we thank you for that. God, as we pray now over this message, as we consider being people on fire for you, as we consider being a church on fire for you, God, uh, we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in our hearts right here, right now, today. God, in this passage today, we're going to take a pretty long look at, at the fact that the people who heard this message originally to the early church and now to this church today, uh, they were cut to the heart. And so, God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would cut us to the heart here today, and not in a bad way, but in a good way, that you would show us the way that we should go, that you, should, that you would uh, encourage us to continue on in the way we are going and, and reveal to us maybe some things in our lives that are holding us back from you working fully and holy, God. And so I pray now that these words would be your words and not mine. We do believe that your your word, the Bible, is fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it's written without error, and we hold it as the authority in our life above all other authorities. And so we open up our hearts and surrender ourselves to that authority now during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so I got a question for you. Have you ever done something in life and then a little while after really regretted it? Anybody? Like you're like, oh, I made this decision. Like, you know, maybe you're out like in a rural area and your gas tank, the light's on and you just kind of keep driving and you pass the last gas station for like 100 miles and then you realize you're going to be walking 20 because you ran out. Maybe it's more immediate like that. Maybe that little picture of a motor has been on the dash of your car for a while and about a year goes by and you finally get it looked at and your mechanic tells you that if you got it fixed when it first came on, it would have been $100 and now it's $1,000 and you're like, oh, I regret it. You know, we've got those moments in our life. Or maybe your friend thinks he's like the next uh, master chef and decided to make you some chicken tartare so you gave it a go and you regretted it almost probably immediately, right? If you don't know what chicken tartare is, you can Google that one. Uh, But either way, uh, we have these things that we regret. Some of them are bigger, though, right? Like, you know, that spring break tattoo you got? They kind of last with you for life, maybe? No? Anyways, there's probably some folks in the room, right? We got some tattoos around that we wish maybe we did a little different. But either way, sometimes they're even bigger. Like, we should have taken that job that we got offered. 
Or maybe we should have left that job sooner. Or maybe it was a financial decision, like you wish you bought some Bitcoin or some Tesla five or six years ago. Know what I'm saying? So we have all these kind of things in our life that are really external that we go through and we think, oh man, if I had only made that decision then, I would have, had, I would have been in a better place today. Well, you got to know that, that life seems to be kind of a series of, of, of bad decisions. And some are really big, some are small, some have immediate consequences, and some of them have long-term consequences. In our passage today, we're going to see a group of people who made a decision based on what they believed to be 100% true, and then they found out that it wasn't, and they came to this place to regret what they've done, and they, they literally almost say in the passage, what have we done? But you can read it out of the passage that this is the place that they were in. And so before we get to the passage, I want to give you a little recap. If you've missed a couple of weeks, this will kind of bring you up to speed. If you've already heard all of these messages, I am not Netflix or Amazon Prime. You can't skip the recap. There's no button, so you're going to hear it anyways. All right? So we're in the series Church on Fire. We started Acts 1. We're in Acts 2. We're going to land this series in a few weeks. Uh, but Acts 1, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's on earth 40 days. He's doing all kinds of teaching and still doing miracles and those kind of things. And then Acts 1.8, his last words are, you will receive, what are we going to receive? Power. Thank you. If you were here last night, they didn't get that one so well. But he says that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? And you're going to be my witnesses here, near, and far away to sum that part up. But then he ascends to heaven. Remember, they kind of watched him go up, and then they said, hey, what are you doing? You know, he's coming back the way he came. And so then afterwards, and Bailey uh, did a great job preaching on the Pentecost a couple of weeks ago, where the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of fire on everybody that was there, and all those people that were gathered from all different areas that spoke different languages heard the gospel in their own language by a bunch of people that didn't know how to speak that language. Crazy, right? And so here we are in this, with this group of people. They see the Holy Spirit come down on them like a fire in separate tongues that, that comes and speaks all these languages to them. They're hearing for the first time a clear gospel message about Jesus in their own language. By the way, that work is still going on today. Look up Wycliffe Bible translators. The word of God is being translated in every language around the globe. It might not look like it did then, but the Holy Spirit's still doing that work today. Pretty powerful. So here they are. They see all this that goes on. And then Peter and Pastor Conrad and Tom shared this last weekend. And so as, as they talked about it, Peter, one of the apostles, he stands up. Okay, I want you to remember, this is the Peter that denied he knew Jesus three times. Now he's in front of thousands of people, okay? Still a chance of persecution, but he stands up with the other apostles present and he begins to preach. Just like I'm preaching now, obviously a lot different, but just stands up above and with everyone seated and begins to kind of be a herald for the gospel. He starts to preach. And so last week, he begins to point them back to the book of Joel and he talks to them about what they already knew Something we probably miss when we read scripture, when they're speaking to a Jewish audience, when we read the word of God, and they're, they're devout Jews in that time, they would have known all of those scriptures, the, the, the scriptures that we call uh, the Old Testament or their Torah, they would have known them by heart almost. Unlike us, where we got to like, you know, go look it up or Google the Bible verse or whatever, because we don't have that type of learning model in our culture. They would have sat with a rabbi, and actually there was no, no printed Bibles like we have or, or books like we have now. They would have memorized large portions of Scripture. So as Peter gets up, he's telling them passages of the Old Testament, basically, that they already knew. And he's pointing them to say, hey, God told you through the prophet Joel that all these things were going to happen. And now today, the sermon continues from Peter. And so everyone is gathered. This, this is the continuation of the sermon that Pastor Tom and Pastor Conrad shared last week. And he begins now to quote David, King David, the patriarch of their faith. You know, the one who slayed Goliath and was the king over Israel. He begins to quote him as another prophet who pointed to this Jesus who they crucified. So I want us to do something here today. 
I want us to get into the mindset or the heart, put ourselves in the place where Peter is preaching to us as I read this passage of Scripture. I'm not going to have you stand and read it. I want you to listen as though I'm Peter and you're one of the people sitting there hearing it, okay? We're going to play a little game of let's pretend. You guys like playing a game of let's pretend here for a minute? You guys all down for that? Okay, so we're going to do that, but we don't actually have to pretend that much. The really cool thing about the book of Acts is is that it was written to the early church, and we're still the church. Until Jesus comes back, the book of Acts basically is still being written because he's doing this work through his people. In fact, we talked about that first week that the book is addressed to Theophilus, which means God lover. Any God lovers in the room online at North? Any God lovers? All right? Let's praise God if we love God. Okay? So as I read this, I want you to listen like you're sitting around and the Apostle Peter is there because these are not my words, it's the word of God. I'm just reading it. I want you to hear it and I want it to penetrate your heart. Holy Spirit, would you let this word penetrate our heart the way it did those early believers when this word was written. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. Acts 2, 22 through 41 Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross." I want you to, I want to pause for a minute. I got a couple other pauses in here. Think about the scene for a moment. They just saw this amazing work of God. They're sitting here making eye contact with Peter, and he looks him in the eye, and he says, you killed Jesus. I want you to hear that. Because we weren't there in person, but we need to, and these people may, some of them may not have been there in person, but we need to know that our sin and our life is what hung Jesus on the cross. We need to hear that almost as first person. Even though we weren't even born yet, our sin is why he went to the cross. And so we need to hold on to that thought. But can you imagine for a moment sitting and hearing Peter going, you killed this guy, the guy that you saw resurrected and who's doing this work. Let me find my place again. This man who was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep his hold on, keep its hold on him. I'm gonna read that verse again, and I want us to listen to it for a moment because that's the hope that we have in Christ Jesus is this one line right here. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible, someone say impossible, for death to keep its hold on him. Praise God. David, King David, the prophet, said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. It means you won't be afraid about anything. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is still here this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what, ha- what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah and that was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. 
When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Someone say 3,000. Do you believe that God could still add 3,000 people to the kingdom that day? My prayer is that there'd be a few just in this room today that that the Holy Spirit would touch your heart and say, yes, God, I do believe in you. I want you to remember this main point here today, okay? If you only remember one thing from this message today, I want you to remember this. It's our takeaway, and it is that repentance is the action of our faith in Jesus. Repentance is the action of our faith in Jesus You see, these people who were gathered, they had a regrettable moment. They thought they were following one way. They thought they were doing the right thing. They stood and said, crucify him, crucify him, because they thought that he was a false prophet, a false teacher. They didn't believe that he he was who he said he was, even after he did all those miracles, even after he did all those miracles. But then they're seeing the risen Jesus. They're seeing him ascend to heaven. They see the Holy Spirit come down on people and do the works that he's doing. And now they're like, oh my gosh, what did we do? What did we do? And they were cut to the heart. As we look at verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Hey, I'm not trying to lay guilt on us. I want us to leave today encouraged. We're going to get there. As we know, the word of God sometimes discourages us just for a minute before it encourages us because it confronts us with, with the work that God wants to do in our life. But the truth is, is that all of us hold some responsibility to why Jesus had to come and die on the cross. It's just the truth. But The good news is he did that because he loves you so much and he wants to pull you up out of that sin, pull you up out of that place that has a death sentence attached to it and put you in a place with him for eternity. That's what he wants for you. And so they had heard this and they they, they, they were cut to the heart. They had that moment where God worked in their heart through the Holy Spirit. We got to remember the Holy Spirit had descended upon Peter. He's still filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit is speaking through him to the crowd that's there. It's the Holy Spirit that draws people to God. Someone say Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that draws a person to God. It's, a whole, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts them and also draws them and helps them to understand the love that God has for them. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. God chooses to use his people to speak about it. Peter didn't save anybody. God did that work here. And they ask a big question. And it's a big question that we should be asking regularly. And the question is this. They say, brothers, what shall we do in verse 37 what shall we do you know it's interesting as we are convicted in our walk with the lord as we're convicted even as god is calling us to him we all come to a place where we have to ask that question what shall we do can we ask that question together online north here in person what shall we do what shall we do We've got to ask that question. That question, by the way, that's a repentant question. That's a repentance question. You see, we've got to understand that repentance is kind of a, a, an ugly word in our world. We don't, we don't think about it. We, we, we kind of probably, you know, we picture like uh, Monty Python's search for the Holy Grail is what we think about, right? Uh, that we've got to walk in some sort of strange, you know, head bowed, uh, you know, uh, self Uh, denial type of way when we think about repentance and there's probably a moment for grieving our sin in our life we should really look at those things and and grieve it but what repentance means is that we turn from our way and follow other ways repentance is literally just a turning towards God and away from ourselves or away from the culture or whatever it is we're following it just means to turn that's what repentance means 
You know, what we do quite often, though, is, is we get confession confused with repentance. You see, a lot of us actually live a life of confession, but we don't live a life of, of repentance. That's what we'll do. In fact, we might only have partial repentance in our life, all right? And all the Bible scholars in the room, send me an email on this one. It's okay. But the truth is, many of us will live our entire life in partial repentance, We may come to a place where we say, yeah, I realize that I'm missing God in my life. I realize that I'm a sinner. I I, I know this. I I realize that. I realize that I can't make up for my own sins myself. We come to that realization. And then someone presents us with Christ and we say, yeah, that's what I want in my life. I need forgiveness of my sins. I'm going to follow him. And we take that first step of repentance but we don't actually take the ongoing steps of repentance. And then life kind of looks like this. Yes, I have Jesus. I've added him to my life, but I'm walking through everyday life, and all I'm doing is confessing and asking for forgiveness of my sins, and then I just say, well, we all sin. We all carry on. But what we miss out on is, as we live this life just confessing and partial repentance, we actually miss out on the fruit that God wants to work and grow in our life of the Holy Spirit. We miss it. Because we're not really turning from it. We're just asking for forgiveness when we go to it. Repentance, though, is a daily walk to say, God, I'm going to turn from these things. Whatever it is that you're showing me, God, I'm going to move from following my way, and I'm going to follow your way. The reason why we most often don't walk in repentance is, is that we're afraid to give up something in our life, and we can't see what God is going to replace it with. We can't see in the eternal realm or in the spiritual realm fully and wholly what God is going to replace it with. And so this walk of repentance is actually a walk of trust. It's, it's faith to say, okay, I find some sort of solace. I find some sort of comfort in this thing of the world, even though I know it's wrong, but I'm afraid to leave it because I don't know how I'm going to cope without it. But it's that process of turning and saying, you know what? I'm going to trust you, God, in this area. You tell me that you're going to fill all of these things in my life. You're going to take care of these voids in my life, and you're going to grow new things in my life. It says in the passage, if we go to 238, it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see the progression of this, though, for a minute. Because a lot of us, we walk through life as followers of Jesus, and we're asking for the Holy Spirit, yet we've skipped something. Someone say repent. Yeah, we skipped the repent part. We want the Holy Spirit to come into our life. We want him to do a work, but we haven't stopped working in those areas in our life that are unpleasing and dishonoring to God. And so what happens is it's, it's kind of like a garden, And this is that time of year where where many of us are planting gardens. And so it's like a garden where we went out and we planted a tomato bush. Now, if you planted a tomato plant, it's probably a plant, not a bush. Either way, you planted a tomato plant. You want that tomato plant to produce nice, ripe, juicy tomatoes. Would you guys all agree? Okay. In your spiritual life, do you want your spiritual life, your relationship with Jesus, to produce nice, healthy, ripe tomatoes? abundant fruit. Would you agree? Or do you want just one little meager tomato on there that's being eaten by a tomato worm? You want one of them and say, is that our spiritual life? We don't, right? But here's the thing about our walk with Jesus. Look, once we've given our life to Jesus, we're in. There is nothing that can take that away. Go to Romans 8.1. It says, there is now no condemnation for he or she who is in Christ Jesus. That's just the truth. But what we're doing is, is we're short-circuiting ourselves on being on fire for Christ because we haven't weeded out all the things that are in our garden. We're trying to grow this beautiful tomato plant that is our spiritual life, but yet it's being choked out by all the weeds that are around it. We're coming to church, we're reading the Bible, we're doing all these things, we're fertilizing our, our spiritual life, but we've allowed all those weeds to stay in our life. And you know what a weed does in a garden? It sucks out all the nutrients out of the soil. If they get big enough, they begin to shade the sun. They do all of those things. They choke out the good fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to do in our life. And our tomato plant is just kind of meager and looking terrible, susceptible to dying. And unfortunately, our spiritual life looks like that a lot of times, doesn't it? So when we think about repentance, we need to understand it is not a bad thing. 
It's God wanting to root out those things that are keeping us from growing in our relationship and, and having the Holy Spirit poured out in our life the way he's called us to. Because I don't know about you, maybe I'm all alone up here today, online, north, somebody's probably with me, but I want this year to be marked by a deeper relationship with Christ Jesus. I want to grow in the pouring out and presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to deepen in that fellowship and relationship and understanding of who Jesus is. Anybody with me? Anybody want more of that in our life? Well, the truth is, is we have to repent to get there. We've got to go through a time of repentance. We have to let God examine our heart. And, and so when we look at, at, 30, at verse 38 here, repentance comes first. There's initial repentance, and then every day we have to ask that question, God, what area in my life is not in alignment with you? What, what area in my life is, is not uh, honoring to you? And, and so it says repent and then be baptized. We talk a lot about baptism here, but baptism basically means this. Thank you for uh, sitting in the front, Carl. So Carl is living his whole life, okay? He's living his whole life uh, thinking that he's a good enough person. He's done some nice things in his life. He's helped a few people. He's done some things. He helped a little kitty down from a tree one day, and he thinks that's what's getting him into heaven because he's more of a good person than a bad person, all right? I'm not going to ask to raise hands, but a lot of us live our life that way. He even goes to church once in a while, and, and so now he's, he's good. God wrote his name down. He's all set. And then one day... The Holy Spirit gets a hold of his heart, and he's confronted with the truth that he is just never going to be good enough to be in the kingdom of heaven. And he says, you know what? Yeah, I need to turn from that, so what should I do? And someone shares the gospel with him, and he gives his life to Jesus. He, asks for, he confesses that he's a sinner. He, he asks Jesus to forgive him of his sin, and he turns. He repents by making him Lord. That's that act of repentance. That's the action of our faith in Christ is to turn and repent. He does that. And then... He wants to make it public. You see, baptism helps us to make it public. It's saying, hey, I gave up all these ways that I was following in my life, and I am going to loud and proud tell the world, it's almost like spiritual accountability, to say, I am no longer the old Carl, okay? And so I am no longer the old Carl. I'm a new Carl, and I'm going to be baptized to show the whole world uh, that this is who I am in Christ Jesus. And then it says, and we go back to verse 38, Rhonda, there for a minute. Back to verse 38, and then it says, in the name of Jesus Christ. you got to know when the word of God says the name of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the authority of Jesus. Someone say authority. authority. It's the authority of Jesus, okay? We like to slap the name of Jesus onto the end of a prayer and hope he's going to bless our plans and all that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. If you're taking notes, write down Philippians 2 because it says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That means those who have gone on ahead of us, that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, a bright morning star, that his name is authoritative above all things. That's what it means in the name of Jesus. That's what it looks like to walk in a place of repentance to say, I'm going to submit my heart, my life to your authority. That means that I have to give up some of the ways I believe, some of the ways I think, the things that I want to be right on, some of the behaviors that are in my life. God wants me to turn to him. And in return, here's the gift. You get forgiveness of sins, and then you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit more and more and more. Every area of your life that you turn over to Christ Jesus, it's a daily thing. Is it not a daily thing? Because I like to take some things back. All right, I like to give and, and take it back as much as I can, but it's a daily walk of giving these things over to Jesus, and he then fills you with the gift of the Holy Spirit in that area. We can't continue to go our way and expect God to lead us in his way. You can't do those two things. Sometimes they line up, but it's when we've turned our heart towards him and sought his way above all things. Repentance is the action of our faith in Jesus. If you've said that you have faith in Christ Jesus but have just gone on to live your life the way you want, you need to, you need to ask yourself, am I really repentant? Have I really turned my life towards him? I want you to think about this thought is, is that when we're under the, when we surrender to the authority of Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we're under the authority of Jesus, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's an ongoing authority that we give to him. But this is what's happening in this passage. And he says that this promise, 
is for you and for your children and those who are far away and all who God calls by his name. All who, who, who he calls. It's for all of us. It's for today. It's for tomorrow. It's for us. It's for our kids and our kids' kids and the generations after. That's a broad promise for any human being that decides to follow Jesus. That sounds like a pretty awesome offer to me. Would you agree? That sounds pretty awesome. So as we wrap up here today, as we think about us being those God lovers, those seekers of God, as we think about where we're at with repentance, as we consider that do we want to be individual followers of Jesus on fire, do we want to be a church that's on fire, we've got to consider where we're at with repentance. See, I know, myself included, that there's areas in all of our lives that we need to turn over to God. I realize that messages like this sometimes will be, hey, I am never coming back to that church, or it, it, it warrants a phone call to me because you're upset with me because I, I confronted something through the word of God that was a, a sticking point in your journey. That's okay. I signed up for that. Please reach out. I'd rather talk with you even if you're not happy with me. But who I really want you to talk to is God. If you never come back to Christ Community Church, my heart is, is that you would take the things of the word of God and wrestle with them wrestle with them. You owe it to yourself, to your own spiritual well-being, to take the things that the Holy Spirit convicts you with and press into them and wrestle with them. And so as we do that here today, I want to encourage you to just take, we're going to take some time and look at this one big question. And I think it's a question we could ask ourselves daily when we start our day and throughout the day. Do the attitudes of your heart and the actions of your life align with your faith in Jesus? Are we living a life of repentance or just a life of confession? Are we living a life of partial repentance or are we trying to have a walk of repentance in our life so that the Holy Spirit can be active and developing that fruit in our life in a powerful way? You see, that's our witness and our testimony, isn't it? Many of us in the room have made up our mind about certain things in our life, whether it's an attitude, an action, might even be a belief structure that, that needs to be wrestled with with God. We've made our minds up. But you need to know the entire 66 books of Scripture is God pleading with his creation, that's us, to turn and follow him. Literally the whole Bible, from the moment that sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, all the way to the last book of the Bible in Revelation, God is just pleading with you and me and every human being to stop following our own way and start following God's way. That's what he wants. It's not even complicated. It just takes humility and surrender in our own heart. But God's promise is, is that he's gonna do a work in your life that you've never seen before. It's gonna do a new work. So I want us to just take a minute. We're gonna actually just kind of be here as, as Brad plays. But I wanna give you an illustration before we get to a moment of silence here. Brad, this yesterday in prayer time, he said that he's just really enjoying the uh, recovery group on Monday nights. I have permission to share this story. Uh, living free on Monday nights that Conrad is leading. And uh, just excited that it's growing and it's getting momentum. It's up at the North Campus, North Campus, little shout out there. But he said something. I was like, wow, I got to see if he'll let me share that in an hour. And uh, he goes, we started the STEP program and the, the, the material that they're going through, he said, I really have been convicted that I've got some areas of disbelief in my life. Going through it and talking about it, the Holy Spirit's convicting him that he's got some areas of disbelief. My friend Brad right here. But he's not running from it. He's leaning into it. He hasn't got it all figured out. But to be open to say, hey, you know what, God, help me in my disbelief. I want to turn from those areas of disbelief and turn towards belief. That's literally what we're talking about. And we're going to take a minute to do that right now. But I want to encourage you to consider this question each and every day of your walk in fellowship with Jesus. Let's take a moment to reflect and then I'll close in prayer.
Dear Jesus, we first off want to come to you with gratitude in our hearts for what you've done, who you are, how much you love us. We acknowledge, God, that we're partially responsible for hanging you on that cross because of our sin. And Lord, that you took our pain and our punishment because of your great love for us, and we want to say thank you. May we never take that for granted. And God, on behalf of myself and everyone listening to this message right now, we repent, we turn from our ways, we confess that we have often followed our own ways or made our mind up and not been open to you changing it. Holy Spirit, show us those things in our life, the things that we need to surrender to you, the things that aren't honoring to you, the things that are in attitude or in action that you want us to turn and follow you in, God. Show us, Holy Spirit, what those are. And Holy Spirit, thank you for being in us and guiding us through this life, Lord. We're not in this alone. We have your great grace and your mercy and your power. So God, we say thank you for that. God, I think of those in the room who maybe are giving their life to you for the first time today, just reaching out and saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to turn and follow you, make you the Lord of my life. If that's you doing that today, you need to know that there's nothing now that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus that there's no more condemnation, that today, even if you've been convicted uh, for the first time or an ongoing time here today, you need to leave with your head held high here because of God's great grace and mercy. Thank you, God, for that. God, we are just moved by the work that you want to do in us and through us. Holy Spirit, we just ask for you to continue to fan that flame that's in our heart and in this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, we're going to conclude the service. I want to hand it over to Pastor Tom at the North Campus. He'll, he'll close out the service up there, and we appreciate you guys being online with us. If you're listening to this as a post-watch, we thank you for joining as well. And church, leave today encouraged. We love you so much. God bless. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you've been blessed by the service. If you don't have a church home, we would love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. And you can connect with us by going to cccfamily.com. Let us know that you've been uh, joining us for church. You can fill out the online connect card there. Give us your information. We can help you take the next step. If you have a prayer concern that you'd like our prayer teams to pray about, you can do that as well. If you'd like to support the ministry here at Christ Community Church, you can also give online at cccfamily.com and we appreciate all that God is doing in and through each and every one of you. Hey, thanks again for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you again soon, either online or in person. God bless you.